Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for dialing in for today's Wednesday seminar. Um, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name's Adam Bailey. I'm going to be the cha your chair for today. Um, I will take a moment, though, to point out that although I am chairing the session, uh, we have uh, Tahani Palu um, from Onshore Energy um, to thank for organising today's speaker. Um, as she's been collaborating uh, through the Kinematica project for a while now um, with, with him and uh, has, has put in all the hard yards to get this off the ground. So thank you, Tahani. And if she was here, she would be chairing this. So hopefully I can do as good a job as I'm sure she would have done. Um, I'll just get started with our acknowledgement of country. Um, Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia, and acknowledges their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to the people, cultures and elders past and present. Um, this morning we're lucky to have uh, a really great speaker um, who's come down from Sydney today to speak to us. Um, this is Dr. Bavik Lodia and his presentation is entitled Vertical Fluid Mobility of CO2, Methane, Hydrogen and Hydrocarbons Through Sandstones and Carbonates. Um, I'll let him uh, obviously give you the detail on what, what all that actually means, um, but Bavik uh, is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. He completed his PhD in Geology and Geophysics from Imperial College in London and has a master's degree in Earth Sciences from the University of Oxford, also in the UK. Uh, Dr Lodia is the current Secretary of the Australian Society of Exploration Geophysicists New South Wales branch and his research interests include geodynamics, basin modelling, natural resources and seismology. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr Lodia to the podium. Virtual there. Um, please take us away. Cheers. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, Adam. And yeah, so as Adam mentioned, um, this project that I've been working on is part of the ARC funded Kinematica um, project, which I'm working on with Dr. Stuart Clark from University of New South Wales. And we have several partners of which Geoscience Australia is, is one of um, is one of the partners on this project. And we're also working with um, CSIRO in this project as well and working quite closely with um, Tehani as part of this. And also accompanying me today is um, one of our PhD students from our group, um, uh, uh, Hari, who's also working on the Kinematica project um, as part of as part of this wider work. So my presentation today is something which I've sort of been delving into since starting this project. My background originally is within sort of traditional geology and geodynamics, as Adam mentioned. Um, however, the work in this presentation is something that really only started as a thought experiment, um, but then developed into something more um, during the time when we were all in lockdown in Sydney, couldn't go into the office, so it was just me and my computer and able to just do some coding, which you don't need to do field work or anything like that for. So without lockdown, I don't think this would have happened, to be honest. Um, so it's kind of uh, worked out quite well in that sense. Um, so yes, just going forward now. So first of all, um, fluids in sedimentary basins, why are these important? So of course we know that fluids, for example, water, hydrocarbons, etc., these migrate over geological timescales. And of course these fluids accumulate in traps and these traps are commonly targets for natural resources or increasingly now for you know, things like CO2 storage. Um, and just the figure you can see on the screen here is just from a from a textbook, um, Hanschel and Karnoff, 2008. And here we can see just the sort of basic two-dimensional um, cartoon of how fluids um, move on the basin scale. So in this presentation, um, everything I'm talking about is basin scale, not pore scale stuff. So in this case here, we have this source rock. Um, from which hydrocarbons in this case are being generated and these are generated as of course these source rocks are buried and um, put under higher pressures and temperatures. 
as fluids are produced, these fluids move up due to their buoyancy um, through these carrier beds until they um, reach this um, this layer here, which is overlain by an impermeable sealing rock. And then once they get to this interface here, where, um, through which they cannot move, these fluids um, will migrate to these um, antiparanal traps in this case. So of course, this is the essentially basin modeling as a process simulates this on the basin scale. Um, basin modeling is commonly used in the industry and also in academia to simulate this process um, over geological time. But the question that we had was, number one, can we do something like this, but for other fluids other than just hydrocarbons? And number two, how does this work if we're talking about fluids that move on human timescales? So for example, for CO2 storage and for hydrogen storage and potentially exploration, um, we're not interested in how these have moved in geological time 100 million years ago. We're interested in where the CO2 will go if we injected it in the ground today in the next 50 years, 100 years, um, or, you know, whatever. So the question was, how can we simulate this process for different fluids and at different timescales. So this brings me on to the next um, topic within, within this um, field, which is that of fluid mobility. So you're going to hear me mention this term many times throughout this presentation. But first of all, you know, the concept of of mobility. What is this? So I'm sure that some of you may have may be familiar with the Darcy flow equation, which can be used to parameterize fluid velocity. And uh, this is used to, and it's essentially just just this written in words. That the velocity is equal to a quantity known as mobility multiplied by buoyancy, multiplied by the direction. So the direction is a vector in which um, the fluid is flowing and the buoyancy is simply the difference in density between the between pore water the fluid multiplied by gravity and then we have this term the buoyancy so algebraically this is what it looks like we've got this the velocity here v is equal to this term mu which is the mobility multiplied by this term here which is the buoyancy so of course, in this case, the fluids are less dense than the water, which is poor water, which is why they're buoyant and they flow upwards. So the mobility can be parameterized, um, and there's been a lot of work done on this over the past 50 years um, on how to parameterize this term algebraically. Um, and this is what it looks like. The mobility is the ratio of effective permeability over the viscosity of a fluid. And the effective permeability is equal to the rock permeability multiplied by the relative permeability. So now we have two sets of, of properties. We've got fluid properties such as the viscosity, volume, and density of the fluids themselves. And then we have some rock properties such as the rock and relative permeabilities of the particular lithology that the fluids are moving in. So in conventional basin modeling, rock volumes are discretized into grid cells and this calculation is performed in every one of those grid cells and that's why basin models take a long time to run you know they can last from you know several hours to you know a couple of days even you know for complex 3d basin models that have a lot of grid cells and that's one of the main drawbacks of, of that process um, of course it requires a lot of computing power um, as well so what we wanted to do was to essentially try and work this out in a computationally inexpensive and fast way, um, something which can essentially be done as a flash calculation as opposed to um, you know, something that would take a lot of computing power in a discretized model, as I explained. Um, and this would essentially be able to answer a question such as what is the velocity of a particular fluid at a particular depth? 
in say a sandstone or carbonate, um, which surprisingly doesn't actually exist. Um, there isn't a straightforward way of just working out what is the velocity of say methane in a sandstone at 1.5 kilometers depth, you know. So that was quite surprising to me. I thought that would actually be out there, but it, it wasn't. It involved all these complicated equations and everything. Um, and so that was one of the main motivations behind this work. So what we did is we designed an algorithm to calculate the mobility of the fluids. And the mobility was the um, term which was shown in the last slide. And then from that, we can calculate the vertical velocities of fluids, because of course, if they're moving upwards, then the direction is is one essentially. And if they're, we can also multiply by a vector if they're moving along a bed, say. So the important quantity is the mobility. And this algorithm calculates the fluid mobility as a function of both the lithology and of depth. So the figure on the screen you can see now is the show all of the different steps within the algorithm. So here we have in these yellow diamonds, these are the inputs. All of the blue rectangles are the um, different steps in the algorithm. And the outputs are um, in these uh, green circles. So we start with, of course, we have our fluid the chemical composition of the fluid that is um, as an input. So whether this is methane, CO2, um, oil, hydrogen, the critical temperatures, critical pressures, all of the fluid properties right, um, are an input. And then also the pressure and the temperature where that fluid particle is at. And the first step of this is to solve what's known as an equation of state or EOS. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. Um, that's a very simple equation of state that relates pressure, volume, and temperature together in one equation. However, there are many equations of state out there which are better suited towards particular compounds or particular um, types of compounds, such as nonpolar molecules, polar molecules, and so on. So by choosing the appropriate equation of state, we can solve this. Um, to calculate the um, density, the volume um, at a particular depth. The viscosity is calculated um, using another method um, known as the lorentz bray clark method, which I'm not going to go into too much detail about that now, but I'm happy to chat to people if you want to know more about this. Um, however, we need these solutions from the uh, equation of state to calculate the velocity. So it's, it's a series of calculations that uh, depend on each other. And to calculate what the pressure and temperature are from the depth, um, we can easily do that just by using sort of textbook um, relationships, you know, which relate temperature and pressure together. So here on the screen, you can see these five uh, geological regimes going from normal in the middle to um, overpressured and then also to like hot and hydrostatic. So under normal geological conditions, um, a pressure temperature um, relationship follows this line. And by choosing a say normal geothermal gradient of between 25 to 30 degrees per kilometer, those are the values we use in this. Um, we can you know, do these calculations. These can easily be changed um, at any step during this calculation. Uh, but for the purposes of this study, those are the values that we used. Um, and then the next values that we need to um, look at are the porosity and compaction parameters. So this is the next step of the calculation. So here the depth and the rock parameters are very important. So the two important rock parameters are the depositional porosity, um, which of course decreases exponentially as rocks are compacted and buried and also the compaction wavelength. So this is the simple equation, you know, porosity equals initial porosity multiplied by an exponential to the minus of um, the compaction wavelength um, and the depth. So we can use that to model the porosity through time. 
And then from those, we calculate the effective permeability, which I will expand on on the next slide. Um, and then putting all of these together, pretty much just like Lego bricks, um, we can build a solution to, to that equation, um, which doesn't rely on grid cells in a model, how I explained before. It relies on where a particular fluid particle is, what rocket's in, and all of these other parameters that we can calculate from that. And then this outputs the, the vertical mobility. Um, So now this is going to be for those um, of you out there who are into porous media. Um, they're probably going to be horrified by the um, upscaling and um, lack of poor scale detail in this method. But um, you know, I apologize. However, this is all basin scale stuff. So as a basin scale geologist, um, this is essentially I wanted to take the poor scale interactions and the poor scale detail out of this whole process so we can speed everything up. So um, yeah. The first thing which needs to be done um, in order to turn hand specimen values for permeability um, and porosity into basin scale values is something known as upscaling. So there are different ways of upscaling. Um, in a horizontal direction, um, permeabilities um, are upscaled by up to a factor of 50, and in the vertical direction, a um, factor of one. And this accounts for large scale heterogeneities within the Earth's surface, of course, which you don't see at the pore scale. Things like faults, you know, fractures, and, you know, um, sort of other features that increase um, permeability, stuff that you just don't see in the laboratory or the hand specimen scale. And this can all be found in just textbooks, um, which is the resource that we used. Um, the porosity depth relationship, as I mentioned in the previous slide we used, is the pretty bog standard um, exponential relationship you see here. So that's the porosity. This is initial porosity. Um, and Z is the depth and lambda is the compaction wavelength. So those are all material properties of the rocks, um, which again, we can get from textbooks for, you know, sort of generic rock types, um, just from data tables. And that's what we what we used here. So the figure you can see on the screen here um, show the hand specimen and upscale values for um, rock permeabilities um, in A and B. So A is for Panel A are the values for sandstones, and panel B are the values for carbonates. Um, so you can see the upscale values are these um, are these dashed lines here, um, and this is a log scale, so they're quite a lot higher. And the porosities, um, the depth relationships for sandstones and carbonates, um, according to this equation here, are shown in panel C by these two curves. So you can see the possibly decreases exponentially with depth. So this allows for basin scale rock permeability estimations. And the next step is to calculate the relative permeability. Now this is where stuff got a bit tricky because there's only really um, one equation within the literature that that relates the, um, porosities with relative permeabilities, and that's this equation here from a study by Holmes 2009. So here the we have the porosity um, to the power of a constant um, multiplied by, that's a typo there, that should be a C, but anyway, Q is this constant, um, and then this is um, SW is water saturation, and then the product of those two gives a constant. Now, the issue with this is that there aren't many laboratory values in the literature that constrain this equation for different rock types. Um, the values for the constant Q range from 0.8 to 1.3 for, um, for most reservoirs. And the value of this constant um, for 
carbonates range from 0.06 um, to 0.005. And for sandstones, um, the range is slightly smaller. Um, it's from 0.02 to 0.1, but still that's over an order of magnitude within that range. And when you're talking about exponential equations like this, of course, that leads to quite high degrees of uncertainty, which I'll discuss in more detail as we go on. But within the literature, um, I could, you know, as I said, there aren't for sort of generic stuff like this, sort of a general case, as opposed to a particular case study. Um, there weren't really very many values to use, which is why we restrict our analysis to just sandstones and carbonates, as opposed to other types of rocks. However, if more laboratory work was done to constrain this equation, we could absolutely extend this to other rock types. Um, so yeah, I just think that's quite important to, to mention. So this figure here just shows those uncertainties that I mentioned. Um, so panels A and B show the relationship between the water saturation and the porosity for A is sandstones and B is carbonate. So, so A is sandstones and C is carbonates on the left hand side. And B and D on the right hand side are the water saturation versus depth. Um, for the same. So as you can see, due to the uncertainty is below a depth of about two kilometers, right, for both rock types, the uncertainties become, you know, very significant. Um, and as you go down, they go, you know, cover the entire range of, of values that you can have. So within this work, we do mention that, you know, this should only be used for depths above two kilometers. However, this can be improved, as I mentioned, if we had better um, experimental data. Um, so that's definitely work that I would be keen to collaborate with people on in the future um, to do that with. But for the top two kilometers, it's, it still looks just about OK. So that's that's good for us. So now we can, as I said, put all of that together um, to look at how different fluids behave um, with, with depth. So the figures you can see on the screen here, there's quite a lot of them. Um, and these figures here um, from where my uh, counter is pointing are for CO2 um, at surface temperatures of zero degrees. Those are shown in the blue lines. And at surface temperature of 20 degrees Celsius, um, those are shown in the, in the black lines. So here you can see we've got volume, viscosity, density and buoyancy. And when CO2 is, at, uh, when surface temperature is zero degrees, we can see these big um, step changes in volume, you know, and in corresponding changes in viscosity, also density and in buoyancy. And this is because this is the point out where CO2 changes from a liquid to a gas. So of course, you're gonna get this big step change in density, buoyancy, volume, and all these things, which is why we see this big decrease in viscosity, decrease in density, increase in buoyancy, and obviously a decrease in volume. And the bottom four panels here are the same things, but for methane. The reasons why there are multiple lines is because these are the solutions for different equations of state, um, but they all follow um, a, a similar pattern. You know, you don't have one which is increasing when the other one's decreasing, so that's why there are multiple lines there. Um, and then the figures on the right hand side show the same thing, but for some other fluids we also analyze. So we have CO2 in black here. Of course, this is surface temperature of zero degrees, um, is this panel. And then of course we see that big change. Maybe it's yeah, where my cursor is pointing. That's the CO2 gas, and this is all liquid. It's dense liquid, that's super critical. Then wet gas is in gray here. That follows a sort of similar shape to CO2, and this is at surface temperature of zero degrees, where, sorry, surface temperature of 20 degrees, rather, the other one's zero. And again, we still see this big increase in buoyancy um, at the um, supercritical to gas transition. Um, but the interesting thing is we go from supercritical fluid to gas, not from supercritical to liquid to gas. And I'll talk about that in the slides coming up. These are the um, the same sort of results, but for other fluids, um, 
green, purple and black are petroleum liquids. So we've got um, volatile oil, light oil and medium oil. Um, they all behave relatively uniformly um, with each other. The, their liquid are throughout all depths in the ground, which is why their buoyancies don't change. And then we have um, methane and dry gas, which of course become more buoyant as they um, go towards the surface. And then hydrogen in blue, which pretty much has a constant buoyancy because it's buoyant everywhere on Earth. And there's there's no change between surface temperatures of zero degrees and 20 degrees. So we only see this big change between what happens at zero degrees and 20 degrees at the surface for CO2, not for any of the other fluids. So this begs the question, why is this is this the case? So here you can probably see it a bit better on these results. So these two panels show the um, values for the mobility um, of CO2 for sandstones in yellow and carbonates in blue at a surface temperature of zero degrees on the left and 20 degrees on the right. And we can see this, um, what's the cursor gone? Yeah, we can see this big change in mobility where we see this big um, increase in buoyancy, which corresponds to the phase change from liquid to gas. Um, however, what's interesting is as we go from a surface temperature of zero to 20 degrees Celsius, the depth of that phase boundary changes from approximately 0.4 kilometers to 0.6 kilometers. So of course this is purely looking at the rock properties and the fluid properties. It's not taking into account anything that's going on beneath the ground that could be you know, other external sources of heat or anything like that. But so in the absence of all of the forces, there will be a difference of 200 meters um, depending on what the surface temperature is. Now this sounds really weird. You might be asking, hang on a minute, are you trying to say that if it's hot outside during the day, does that mean that CO2 will be moving at different speeds hundreds of meters below the ground? Like do one is not related to the other. Um, however, there has been Well, before we come to that, just going back to the fundamental chemistry of, of what's going on um, can shed some light onto answering those questions. So when we look at the critical properties of CO2, um, so this is just a phase diagram, pressure versus temperature and the different um, phases um, for CO2. And the blue line here shows the pressure temperature path of CO2 at a surface temperature of zero degrees Celsius. And then at a surface temperature of 20 degrees Celsius is shown in the red. And the critical point is this point here where my cursor is. So this is where um, gas, supercritical and liquid phases all meet, right? So everything to the right of that point um, will go straight from gas to supercritical. And everything to the left of that point will go through the liquid, dense liquid, and then supercritical phases. So as we can see, um, the critical um, point of CO2 is at approximately um, 313 Kelvin and is at a pressure of I think 7.4 megapascals if I'm not mistaken. These are both properties which are encountered within relatively shallow depths in the earth. You don't have to dig down deep before you get to a surface temperature of approximately 30 degrees, which is the critical temperature of CO2 and a pressure of you know 7.4 megapascals. This shift in temperature by 20 degrees moves this pressure temperature curve to the right of that point. So this is why we're seeing a difference in these phase um, changes and the depths at which they're um, encountered um, for CO2. Now, there has been some work in the literature done in the past five to six years um, looking at how surface temperatures in major urban centers such as Tokyo and some of the big Asian cities, you know, how these um, heat signatures from urban activity in cities can be attenuated to in deeper depth. Um, and one of the, the main mechanism for this is the percolation of groundwater, groundwater that transports heat along faults and microfractures and other um, 
avenues through which it can move. Um, there's been quite a lot of work which has demonstrated that surface temperature um, changes of, you know, even between 10 and 20 degrees can be attenuated several hundred meters beneath um, uh, beneath the surface, which brings us into the realm of the critical point of CO2 because it's pretty shallow. So this is quite interesting because it, it leads to the question that, you know, will long term climate change um, or, you know, the sort of uh, the heating effect of large urban centers, if you imagine cities like Sydney, how deep they go underground, cities like London, all around the world, um, how far this heat travels, does that affect the depth at which CO2 is stable beneath the ground? Should that affect decisions about how deep CO2 is um, injected for things like CO2 storage, um, if it's near a city or if it's near an English intrusion or some other external source of heat? So this is just something which, um, so I actually published uh, an article in ASEX, the Australian Society of Exploration Geophysicists magazine a month ago, um, where I showed this figure. Um, and it's just a sort of like, at the moment, is something that like is a, a thought at the moment um, about potentially how this depth between the depth for the gas to liquid or gas to supercritical depth above which CO2 is extremely mobile um, may change as a result of, um, of, of urban heat islands. Um, so that's something which I'd also be very keen on looking at, looking at this. It'd be very interesting to see um, where these, where the depths to these phase changes from gas to supercritical are um, in places where CO2 injection experiments are happening um, in different parts of the world and actually looking at how those depths change. Um, so that's, it's definitely something very, very interesting. So the next part, and I'm almost getting to the end now, um, is um, regarding hydrogen mobility. So we've been talking about CO2 and also for oil and gas and everything, but another big question is how does hydrogen move through the ground? Of course, hydrogen is the smallest molecule there is. Um, it is extremely mobile. Um, it can diffuse through um, rocks even with low permeabilities in a way that other molecules can't. So it's a complete different ball game to the sort of traditional molecules that geologists and geochemists are, are looking at. So this, um, and again, there's no distinction between um, the results depending on how surface temperature changes because hydrogen is already buoyant everywhere on Earth. So the figure you can see on screen here show the results for the mobility versus depth for hydrogen in sandstones and carbonates. The reason why this is important is because, of course, for hydrogen storage, we want to know, OK, how far will hydrogen move away from an injection site um, with time in the time scale of years or tens of years? And also another thing that's been gathering momentum um, over the last couple of years is hydrogen exploration, um, as in the commercial exploration of hydrogen in a similar fashion to how oil and gas is explored for. Now, in the case of South Australia, the South Australian state government has already started issuing exploration um, permits for hydrogen exploration um, as early as last year. Although, to my knowledge, I don't know if any companies have started drilling for this yet, but it's certainly looking as though it's going that way. There have been a few documented discoveries of naturally sourced hydrogen um, throughout the world. One is in Mali in West Africa and another one is in the Pyrenees in Spain. And in both of these cases, um, faults are believed to act as conduits for mantle-derived hydrogen, which have delivered the hydrogen to um, either surface seeps or um, from, from deeper down in the mantle. I'm going to expand on this a little bit more in the next slide, um, but the main producer of the hydrogen is believed to be the serpentinization of, of um, mafic and ultramafic rocks. And that reaction with water and these serpentinites liberates hydrogen and um, these hydrogen rich buoyant fluids can then migrate to, to the surface. Um, and in the case of um, 
the example in Mali, um, the natural hydrogen discovery was actually successfully um, used to supply to generate electricity for a local town. So it's, it's not a very well known example, um, but I think it's quite an important one um, to, to mention. And the important thing that this work shows is that the maximum vertical velocities of hydrogen, according to this method at least, are between two to 10 times greater than for hydrocarbons. Now, this is important because, you know, if we're trying to sort of make rough estimations as to, you know, whether looking for hydrogen for exploration or even for storage, how far hydrogen will have moved in a particular time, um, using things like basin modeling and methods which are designed for um, hydrocarbons isn't really appropriate because the chemical properties for which those programs have been designed don't take this difference of mobility into account. So this is something that certainly needs to be taken into account if you know future work is going to use approaches like basin modeling um, to, to look at hydrogen. And according to our results, or our theorized results at least anyway, um, the vertical velocity of hydrogen at, in sandstone at depth of zero, so at the surface, will be approximately 4.4 meters per year, and at a depth of two kilometers will be approximately half that at 2.2 meters per year. So this gives a, a, you know, at least the first measure that I've seen about how fast hydrogen moves in, say, a sandstone on a human timescale. So I would love to take this work further because it's, it's very exciting. Now, this is a figure from something which I've just it should be getting published in either next month or the following month's ASEG magazine, so I suggest you um, look at that if you're interested. But it opens up a question as to hydrogen exploration. Could this be the next big thing? Um, as I mentioned, uh, percolating um, meteoric waters um, are theorized um, in several locations around the world. Um, West Africa, Pyrenees, and also in New Caledonia. There's active research going on at the moment, um, which is looking at the New Caledonia ophiolite and the interaction between meteoric water percolating down to the sole of the serpentinite. This reacting, producing hydrogen rich fluids, and these fluids then leaking up to the surface, you know, uh, surface seeps, you know, where there are faults and other, you know, micro fractures. And also interestingly, in the case of New Caledonia, there is, you know, salt as well um, documented within that basin. Salt caverns are, of course, already used on the industrial scale as a store for hydrogen. So this is exciting because potentially um, we should maybe have a rethink on the whole sort of uh, uh, issue of hydrogen. Um, exploration, is there a hydrogen kitchen in the same way that there is a petroleum kitchen, but just where instead of a source rock, you have other processes such as serpentinites and fluids reacting. Instead of migration, you have um, the percolation of these fluids through um, faults as opposed to reservoirs. And instead of traps, the question is, will the hydrogen be stored for long enough to access it on a human time scale as opposed to for millions of years, which is what we look for when looking for oil and gas. So this is literally a figure that I finished making yesterday. So it's pretty, um, it's it, at the moment, pretty high level thought experiment stuff, but it's something which I'm definitely keen on talking to people about, hearing your ideas um, and um, yeah, weaving the fluid mobilities work into this. So these are just some uh, results for, for other fluids. Um, I'm not going to go into this too much, um, but essentially we can use this algorithm for any fluid if we know the properties, the critical temperature, pressure, um, the molecular masses, that's literally all that's required. And then the geological conditions. So and these calculations are instant because it's just a series of, of uh, of steps that can be easily done on either a calculator or on a computer. Um, so in summary, we use the Darcy flow based algorithm to calculate basin scale mobilities and vertical uh, maximum vertical velocities for CO2 
methane, hydrogen, and hydrocarbons. We, um, our results indicate that CO2 phase boundaries are affected by depth, um, geological conditions, and potentially um, surface or near surface temperatures. Um, this indicates that CO2 stability for storage may be impacted by anything that changes the heat conditions um, within the subsurface, such as long term climate change, urbanization, also igneous activity, and so on. And we also find that hydrogen velocities are significantly greater than hydrocarbons, which is not surprising, but being able to quantify that is important. And the results of this work were recently published in a paper in Nature Scientific Reports, so that publication is available now, um, if you would like to have a read at that. And the uh, also there was a magazine article, which uh, I mentioned earlier in um, ASEX, monthly magazine um, about the whole surface temperature and CO2 um, sort of story. And there should be another one coming out on the hydrogen exploration um, topic, which I touched on briefly. So yeah, that's it from me and I'm happy to answer questions and to discuss this um, after the talk as well.